you're talking with a lot of people who have, for some reason, kind of become exceptions. Uh, so I have people who say to me, you know, they've you kind of reinvented yourself here. And yeah, what I, my path has not, you know, question, are there any normal paths when you get right down to it? But when I speak at CLE events, I have people come up to me that if you ask in the bar and say, is this guy a real lawyer? Is, you know, or is, is, he, is he really in the, yeah. You know, he's a litigator, he's a this, he's a that, he's a negotiator, he's he, practicing law for a living every day, gets up and goes to the law firm, works with his colleagues and stuff, and they are extremely happy with what they're doing. They're extremely, sometimes they're a little frustrated with the folks around them and with how negative, unnecessarily so, they say. So we t I tend to think about this stuff from the standpoint of people who are a little bit pessimistic, a little bit uh, towards the depressed side, a little bit unhappy, because I think that was my experience coming through. You know, and when people say, can you change, I mean, yeah, I can go back and show you my scores uh, at Authentic Happiness the first time I went there. I was a pessimist, you know, uh, I expect probably there were periods and times where, where on the depression scale I was bordering down, so I didn't like what I was doing, didn't feel engaged with that. Uh, so I've, you know, I've changed. These people look, you know, when you look at it from their end, the people who, Jonathan Haidt, University of Virginia, talks about people who won the cortical lottery. So for whatever reason, genetics, uh, experience, upbringing, whatever, they're happy, optimistic, positive, they're resilient, they can come to, and they come, some of them come into law, and they stay that way. If you think about it, what it's like for them, they're sitting there going, why are you doing that? Why are you being so negative? It doesn't help. It doesn't get anywhere. This is the way that works. And we're sitting there going, look, this is just reality. This is the way it is, you know, it's just, you know, and they're sitting there, why are you doing that? And so there's this, and they're not going to engage with you. You know, they're not going to go to their law partner and say, man, you're just being negative. Because they can't figure out why you're doing that. They assume there must be a reason, so they, they don't. But they're sitting there puzzled about the, why the rest of us are doing what we're doing and why we create this kind of negative environment around us. So, so David Meister, who's kind of the leading consultant, I guess, in the world to law firms and accounting firms and stuff like that, um, and, and wrote an article a couple years ago that appeared in... Uh, I think the American Lawyer magazine. It's now a chapter in his latest book, which is called Strategy and the Fat Smoker, uh, which the title tells a lot about that book. You know, if you're a fat smoker, your strategy is lose some weight and stop smoking, stop doing the things that are bad for you. Um, and so in many cases, that's the answer in some of the situations we are, is you know, stop doing stuff that doesn't work, that hurts you. Uh, but he's got a chapter in there, and he talks about lawyers, and he says, you know, after you know, almost three decades of consulting with professional services firms, and saying all through that consistently, lawyers are just like everybody else, their firms can be managed the same way. He said, I'm here to say I was wrong, they're not, they're different. And law firms have it, and he talks about how the skills we obtain in law school and the kind of training we get, the mindsets we develop, create an environment inside a law firm that makes them hard to manage, hard to move forward. What's the negativity that we're talking about? I mean, and there, there's data out of the field that shows that the, the quality of the relationships between the people, the way they interact, how that ratio between positive and negative falls depends on, tells a lot about whether or not they're going to be successful, whether or not the, the firm, the team, whatever the, the uh, group is that's working together are going to be able to produce good results. And so you get this, you know, this kind of negativity that we build in the environment, and you get these people who are happy in it out there who are going, why are y'all doing that? So one of the things that I have suggested, you know, folks, from a leadership standpoint, when I mean, you look at this, is that you've got some people who don't need this from the standpoint of saying, helping them in their lives, they, for whatever reason, they're there. You know, they're on the upper end of all these scales, and we're not saying that it's, uh, you can always have more and stuff like that. I mean, maybe that's not, maybe they don't need to be, but they're working with people who they don't understand. They, they don't get it, and they don't know how to help them, and they don't know how to lead, and, and they can't figure out how to be part of that firm in a way that makes sense to them, because they're working off this dynamic, and everybody else is working off that, and they can't communicate. So what some of what we can teach here is how to talk about this stuff, common language sort of thing, and also an understanding, because from our side, from those of us who've been kind of negative, it's like, how do they get lucky all the time? You know, just things seem to work out for them. Well, yeah, kind of, but we get lucky too. We just miss it. You know, we miss seeing that. And so it gives us a language to start talking about. Now, I think, odds are, we're going to move a little bit more their direction than they're going to. There's not a whole lot of reason for them to come towards us. But if they can understand kind of how we got that way and why we're there, and if we can understand, and this is the other message, I think, and this 
may go to, to what Dean Rubin has talked about. It's not that we're weak individuals or you know anything like that. We deal in a tough profession. We deal with parts, with aspects of society, of humans living together, that there aren't any great resolutions for. And we go into that every day and we go into it. I mean, unlike, for example, uh, psychotherapists, you know, or counselors or somebody who knows they're going in to deal with tough situations with human beings and who get trained how to handle that personally, how to keep it from tearing them down, and yet they still struggle with it. We go in with no clue. Nobody ever says in law school, oh, by the way, this stuff's going to suck the life out of you if you let it. And you've got to deal, you're going to have secondary trauma from dealing with the stories over and over again of people who were abused or who, you know, were cheated in their business or, you know, whatever it is. There's all these negative stories that we deal with. It's like, uh, we, don't, we don't even need to talk about that. You don't, well, we do need to know about that because we've got to go out and not only be a lawyer in that situation, we've got to remain a functioning human being first if we're going to be a functioning lawyer. And so by creating this kind of language to talk about it and to understand we've got these values conflicts, we've got these zero-sum kind of situations, we've got, you know, another thing that lawyers deal with is necessary evils. So one of the, one of the constructs that uh, researchers look at is, is this phenomena of what's called a necessary evil. And what that means is that as a professional, you have to use your professional skill and expertise to create pain, either physical or psychological, for another human being. Okay, so a surgeon you're training students to be surgeons, they have to get over. There's, it's almost, a, we've got a built-in instinct not to cut the skin of another human being, not to do that. And they have to get past that in order to be able to help. So they're doing it for a higher good. And nobody's sitting there on the other side trying to make them fail. Well, lawyers, we do that same thing. It's more social pain and psychological pain than sometimes physical, but, but more. <laughs> But we're doing it for an abstract social principle. It is a higher good. But, you know, take the, the uh, lawyer who's defending someone charged with child sex abuse. You've got to cross-examine the child on the stand. There's not a good way to do that. There's not a good a way that's going to leave that child feeling comfortable and defend the rights of your client and defend the justice system for society, make sure that it works appropriately. It doesn't have to get that dramatic. Your labor law, your uh, uh, labor law person advising a company on how to lay people off, you know, or how to fire this employee, you know, over and over and over again, we deal with those situations where somebody's getting hurt, and it's our professional expertise that is facilitating that process. Now, there's a reason, from society standpoint, fires. There's a higher good that we're in service to, still hurting another human being, and again, part of our response to that has been just cut ourselves off from our emotions. That doesn't work so well, and so. Part of why meditation and mindfulness works is that it reconnects in a way that lets us deal with those negative emotions, be able to be present with them without doing it, without you know, having to cut off from them, but we can still, we're tapped into the positive emotions, we're tapped into the growth emotions also, we, t we tap back into our values. So that seems to be what's going on with meditation in terms of why it seems to work so well for lawyers. We know things that build well-being. And the, the point is, when you're kind of in that hole, and you're trying to figure out, it doesn't look like there's a way out. But as you start doing these things, you start to realize the hole isn't as big as you thought. So there's the, there are these interesting uh, studies uh, from the University of Virginia, uh, was where they're conducted, that have people estimate the slope of a hill. They use the same hill uh, on the thing, and they have them estimate the hill. And if they found that if you're standing there with a heavy backpack, um, you're going to estimate the slope of the hill as, as, as both steeper and longer than it, than it really is, or then you would estimate it if you didn't have the heavy backpack on. But even beyond that, if you're standing there with a good friend by your side, you'll estimate it as less steep and less long than you would if you're standing there by yourself. So relationships matter. You know, you, we build friendships with folks. If we really want to change the profession, one of the keys is to create a structure that allows this kind of stuff to become part of the culture. And one of the things I want to work on is creating sets of experiences, materials to support them. You know, the, the research tends to indicate we'll find new ways to do lawyering that will work better for our society and better for us.